Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, lovely to have you with us, and a very warm welcome uh, to our service this morning. Uh, we're delighted to have the Reverend Alastair Bull uh, lead us in worship this morning. Alastair is uh, the Minister Emeritus of St. Field Road Presbyterian Church in Belfast. But on retirement, he relocated, relocated life and home to Korean and now worships just down the road in Valley Willen. He will be known by some of us for he has led a couple of series of Wednesday with, the Word, Wednesday with the Word at our Wednesday morning study, but it's good to have him with us as we share together in warm Christian fellowship. So I thank him for agreeing to conduct our service and pray that God will bless him and richly use him to minister to us in our service. You see from the bulletin, there are quite a number of organizations uh, commencing this week. I don't propose to go through them all, uh, but just to say that if you read the, the announcement bulletin closely, please do give it your prayerful and careful consideration as to how you might become uh, more involved in our church through our organizations. But I just want to highlight the PW meeting on Tuesday evening when uh, young people uh, who were in summer service and away on mission trips uh, will be sharing about their mission experience in those trips or at those trips. And I'll just say, no doubt it will be a very interesting evening for ladies and women. So please do come and uh, encourage our young people uh, by your presence. Uh, next Sunday evening, we'll be welcoming Majid and Anna Tinawe back to New Row. It's two and a half years since they were last with us and a lot has happened in that time. We've had the pandemic, and uh, as well as their work with Syrians in Poland, they have been involved in helping refugees who have fled the war situation in neighboring Ukraine. Uh, so, but do come next Sunday evening to support and encourage Majid and Anna and hear more about their work. There will be a cup of tea afterwards, giving us time uh, to meet up with them. And then just an update on the vacancy. At its meeting last Tuesday evening, the Presbytery gave its approval to proceed to the next stage of the vacancy process. And so all the documents uh, have been submitted to Linkage Commission, and we're now awaiting a confirmation of an appointment uh, with the Commission, which will either be at the end of September. If not the end of September, it will be in October. And then just a, a notice, uh, to do with uh, the accession of King Charles III. Uh, the proclamation of the accession of King Charles III by the High Sheriff of County Londonderry will take place at the Diamond in Coleraine today, Sunday the 11th of September at three o'clock in the afternoon. There will be a re-reading of the proclamation at Roe Valley Arts and Culture Centre in Lima Valley one hour later at four o'clock for those who would prefer to attend there. Alistair. Adrian, uh, thank you very much. It's good to be leading you in worship here today. Queen Elizabeth II has died. We've always known that one day we would hear those words. But that certainty did not rob them of their suddenness, their shock, or their sadness when we heard them on Thursday evening. She's the only sovereign that most of us have ever known. But for many of us, it's as if we've lost a member of the family. And I'm sure that many have been emotional as we've watched the news coverage. During this service, we will give thanks for her life, for her leadership of the nation and the Commonwealth, for her service across the nations of the United Kingdom, and for her Christian faith. We pray for her family and for our new king, However, the main thanksgiving for her life will take place next Sunday morning when Dr. Rob Craig is to conduct worship. At the close of this service, we'll sing the national anthem. 
We're also very conscious that after 70 years, we're at a historic moment. An era is at an end. We could be feeling a sense of dislocation, of uncertainty about the future, especially in the midst of all the economic challenges of the current time. And yet, did you see the sign on Thursday evening? As the flags were raised to half mass just before seven, we were shown first that one on Buckingham Palace and then at Windsor Castle and to the side of it, there was a rainbow. The commentator couldn't interpret the sign of the times, but we can. God's promise to Noah of his grace and care. And here's another promise from Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice and the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. So as we begin our worship, let's affirm by singing a contemporary version of those words that in the midst of turmoil and change, God is the one who is unchanging and on whom we can always rely. God is our strength and refuge.
so let us unite our hearts. Let us pray. O oh God, the eternal and unchangeable one, we bow in your presence this morning. You are the creator and the upholder of all things. Your creation around us shows your wonder, your majesty, your permanence and we are confident that it reflects you and yet even if it should change we will not fear you never change nor does your word written or living for Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever He's still the loving Savior who died to take away our sin, and not only ours, but the sin of the whole world. He's still the reigning Lord, for death could not hold him, and evil can never overcome him. He's still the gentle teacher, helping, guiding, correcting, pointing us in the right direction. And so this morning we make these affirmations in our minds and in our hearts and in our wills, knowing we are on solid ground. We would also, in the quietness of our own hearts, ask that you will forgive us when we step off the solid ground, when we ignore you and your word, when we think that we've got it all sussed out, when we think that we can ignore you and do our own thing, when we don't live as we ought to, forgive us when we're proud of ourselves or our accomplishments. Forgive us when we push ourselves ahead of others and we forget their needs. Forgive us, O oh God, when we push you to the periphery, when we think we can make it on our own. Forgive us all our sins and blot them out because of Jesus and his all-sufficient sacrifice on Calvary and make us we pray you Lord in the likeness of the master may his word be our guide may his spirit inform our conscience day by day may our minds think your thoughts and may our lives be lived to your glory each and every day, conscious of your eye upon us and your ear hearing us in what we say and what we think and in what we do. Hear our prayer and meet with us, we pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. And I'm handing over to Maurice to speak to the boys and girls. Thank you. Good morning, boys and girls. Good morning. Oh, I can't even hear anyone. Good morning. Good morning. And good morning, everyone else. Now, boys and girls, tell me one thing. How was school? Oh, yes. Was school fun? What did you do? Oh, okay. Now, we're going to play a game this morning. 
And uh, me, I like competitions and always girls against boys. Now, and I am, I'm told because we live here, ladies always go first. So girls will go before the boys. So now, I'm going to show you two pictures and tell me just one word that describes both of them. Okay, so girls will go first. Okay, the second one. Now those two pictures, girls, tell me one thing about them. What are they? Guys, any idea? One word that, churches, yeah, oh, church, whoa. Let's find out if she got it right. Yay, she got it right. Now, boy, is your turn. Boy, is your turn now. Now, boys, one. The next, now, boys. Yes, Micah. Um, family. Family, did you get it right? Of course we did. Well done. Okay, girls, now, tell me one thing we do at church. Girls, girls, tell me one thing we do when we come to church. One thing we do when we come to church, yes. We pray, yes. And the boys, Tom, one more thing. We sing, okay, yes. We pray and uh, we sing. We read the Bible. We are taught from the Bible. Uh, we meet our friends when we come to church. Yes, Micah. Yes, we meet our friends, that's right. But something also happens. Every time after church, we go to have tea and coffee, I think church becomes family because we are not just friends, but we want to know how someone's week was, what they've been doing, what they're going through in life. So really, church becomes family. And this morning, we are talking about church as a family. And uh, probably, uh, but... We ask somebody, what is church? I used to think the church was just a tall building, big cathedrals, but I was told that uh, in the, when the Bible was first written, the word church meant people who were called by God, called out of the world to belong to God's family. So church was not a building, but church is the people that God is calling people to himself. Uh, God, is, God wants every boy and girl, God wants every mom and dad, every grand, every grand and granddad, everyone to be part of his family, and that's the church. And maybe you are asking then, how do I become part of God's church? Uh, Jesus tells us in the book of John chapter 14, verse 6, that I am the way, the truth, and the life, that no one can come to God except through him. But Jesus is like a bridge standing between us and God. We come through Jesus to go to God. So Jesus really makes a way for us to be part of God's church and God's family. And then maybe when we become part of God's church, what is special about that? And I'll tell you three little words. I will say no, show, grow. When we become part of God's church or God's family, God wants us to grow him. We know God. But God also wants us to grow in his ways as we walk with him. Remember the song we sing in Sunday school? Read your Bible, pray every day if you want to grow. So we read our Bible, we pray, we come to church, we tell people about Jesus, and in a way we grow. But also when you come to church, we also get involved in church. Some of us are good at singing, playing instruments, helping out at club and everything. You see, there are many, many ways we can grow as we walk with God. Then the last thing God wants us to do is to show his love to other people. Our friends, our brothers and sisters, our friends at school who probably do not know Jesus, we show them what God has done in our lives, what God means to us. We talk to them so that they can also experience God's love. So being church really is about three things. It's about us knowing God. It's about us growing in God. 
is about us showing God to other people. If you forget anything, don't forget those three words. No, show, and grow. Okay, so we'll say a prayer as we finish. We can all join in. Okay, Father God, teach us what it means okay. to belong to your family, the church. Help us to know you, grow in your love, and show your love to others that they also may choose to be part of your family. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, boys and girls, for listening so well. Let's clap for them. You've been fantastic. And I promise you, I nearly forgot. I nearly forgot to bring your sweets today. You know, thank for your honor that your sweets are here today. So we'll sing a song that to me is very special, that uh, God loves each one of us and we are all special. Thanks, Maurice. Um, what I want to know is, what happens to the rest of the sweeties in that bag? <laughs> Normally it's the choir that manages to snaffle them, but I notice he took the rest of the bag away, so you're not getting them. As we mourn the loss of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, we're going to thank God for her life and for her faith going to pray for her family, for our new king, and for us as four nations in one united kingdom, especially in all the present challenges. So let us pray. Almighty and ever gracious God, 
we give thanks for the life of your servant, Elizabeth. We thank you that early on in life she accepted her calling, her destiny, and sought to live that out. Thank you for her life of service, her faithfulness, her kindness, her ability to focus on individuals, even in the midst of crowds. Thank you that she has consistently shown the values of goodness, courage, and resilience. Thank you, Lord. We thank you for her witness to you, her clear and winsome faith, her reliance on prayer, and her life that demonstrated forgiveness, hope, and perseverance. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we thank you for the time she gave to others, for the hope she imparted and the leadership so often demonstrated. Thank you, Jesus, for your servant, your disciple who pointed others to you and who was both salt and light in this world. Thank you that she's now at peace in you, her risen Lord. Thank you, Lord. We pray for her family, her loved ones across the generations who are grieving for her in the public eye and yet at the same time comforting the nations and individuals who've gathered in London, at Windsor and Balmoral, who will gather today in Edinburgh and tomorrow in Belfast. We pray for Charles and Anne, Andrew and Edward and their families. May they know your comfort and trusting in you find true peace at this time. We pray too for our nation as we remember what is past and pray for what lies ahead, that the Lord will truly prosper us above all by giving us grace to turn to him and to trust in him. We pray for our new king, that you, Lord, will give him grace to lead us with the same humility and sacrifice and dedication to duty, that he might recognize that any worldly authority is but temporary and fleeting and given to him by you. We pray also for our new Prime Minister and her new relatively inexperienced government, which faces very many challenges, both nationally and internationally. May she and they look to you for guidance in these times of transition. And we pray that you, Lord, would bless your church throughout this nation. May you give us grace to understand these times, to pray wisely into them, and to act and speak as salt and light in our society, our community, and our culture. And as we bring our offerings this morning, we offer ourselves as your people, as your disciples, that we might follow 
and serve more closely as you lead us. Hear our prayer, which we offer in the name of our crucified and risen Lord Jesus. Amen. Now Elizabeth Harvey is going to read from Ephesians. Thank you. We are reading from Ephesians 3, verse 20, and continuing into chapter 4, verses 1 to 13. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Unity and maturity in the body of Christ. As a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit. Just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. That is why it says, When he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean, except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God, and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Amen. Thank you, Elizabeth. We join to sing only by grace.
few years ago, I was sharing and conducting a wedding for one of our young men in St. Field Road. It was held in Life Church off the Dublin Road in Belfast, a new church, a new fellowship. And some people who'd never been there before said to me, it doesn't look like a church. And on the left of that picture, you can see the entrance which you could drive past and almost miss it. It doesn't look like a church at all. It's actually a former warehouse uh, which has been transformed, or should we say it's been converted. It doesn't have much by way of formal church furnishings. It doesn't have pews, just the chairs you can see on the right-hand side. It doesn't have a communion table. It doesn't have a pulpit. It just has a platform for the musicians and the preacher but what we did find there that day of the wedding, a real warmth of fellowship and a real focus on the Lord, his love, and his wonderful grace. When we mention the word church, and Maurice has already started to help us think about that, what comes to mind? Is it the building and they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes? And just in case you're wondering, um, the middle of the bottom row is St. Field Road, where I was for 24 years. Uh, Glendalough is on the left-hand side, down at the bottom. And the building at the bottom on the right is a church that we help to support um, in St. Field Road in Uganda. Different sorts of churches, and of course, your own building, and we put the Baptist uh, in Coleraine on there as another example. What comes to mind when you think of church? You think of minister, how worship is conducted, the sort of music that's on, the preaching of the word. What comes to mind? Of course, some of you will have heard the view from a generation ago what most people want is a minister that looks like a minister, a church that looks like a church, and to be left alone. What is church? Let's go back to basics. How do we get the word church? The Greek word is ecclesia from which we obviously get ecclesiastical. And lots of languages use it, the French Eglise, the Spanish Iglesia, the Irish is recognizable, as is the Welsh. And the basic concept of ecclesia, and again, Maurice referred to it, it's those who are called out and summoned together. And both often occur in scripture and are therefore important for our understanding of what the church is. And there is a link between the word church and the word call. So the reading that Elizabeth did from Ephesians 3, and by the way, forget the chapter division, it's not helpful here, in Ephesians 3 and verse 21, you've got, To him be glory in the church. And then you go on to verse 1 of chapter 4, and we're told, Lead a life worthy of the calling you've received. But actually, it's lead a life worthy of the calling to which you've been called. That's the RSV which I much prefer to the NIV. Lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Calling. So Paul is saying that God is glorified in the church by his people, by Christians, walking worthy of their calling. The church is God's called people. Here's a quotation from Henry Nouwen. The basis of the Christian community 
is not the family tie or social or economic equality or shared oppression or complaint or mutual attraction, but the divine call. The church is God's called people. Let's develop this idea and apply it. There are four aspects of God's summoning of the congregation of Israel, and we find that mirrored in four aspects of the New Testament church, and these should be true of God's people today. Again, Maurice referred to the first one. God's people are called out, and Hosea 11 verse 1 is a good summary. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. Called out of Egypt. That process of physical salvation, of Passover, of Pharaoh's pursuing army, the Red Sea, the wilderness a sovereign act of God. They couldn't have done it by themselves. God did it all. He changed Pharaoh's mind. He parted the waters. He protected. He provided. It was truly a deliverance. And that deliverance was celebrated through the generations thereafter. And God calls us out of sin and spiritual death. And he alone has made it possible to be freed from our captivity, God has acted through the cross. He gives us salvation. He calls us out of the bondage we're in. He breaks the shackles. He takes away the chains. And we are called to respond in faith and trust and obedience. That's why the hymn we just sang is amazingly appropriate. Only by grace can we enter. Only by grace can we stand. It's God's doing. We owe it all to him. The church belongs to him. And without the love of God, without God's initiative, without the grace of God, without the call of God, there would be no church. called out. So what does it mean for us? Whether in good times or difficult, it's still God's church. It comes from him, and that is both a challenge and an encouragement. It's a challenge, especially to those of us who are in leadership positions. We need to remember it's not our church. It's not the Kirk Sessions church. It's never the minister's church. But it's always God's church. An encouragement because it's God's church. And God has shown that what he starts, he finishes. And we need to remember that because we're fallible and we're sinful. We're called out of sin and bondage. So remember, it's God's church. We're called out. We're also called for. The people were not merely called out of Egypt, nor out of bondage of sin. God called the people for a relationship. Think about Abram and the covenant in Genesis 12. I will establish my covenant, says God, as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you. And so Moses and the people met with God on Mount Sinai. And then the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night accompanied them as they traveled. And they carried with them the tabernacle, a sign of that relationship with God. And then do you remember Jesus calling the disciples in Mark chapter 3? Why did he call 12 disciples? That he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons? Yes, that's there. 
but the first reason was that they might be with him. And 1 Corinthians 1 verse 9 tells us our Christians are called into the fellowship of the Son. We're called to know him through Jesus Christ, to be his disciples, to live a new life in this world that he loves and for which he gave himself. What does this mean? The church is first and foremost about a relationship both personal and corporate with God through Jesus. The church is not primarily an organization to be run. A congregation does not primarily exist for the good of its members. And the church isn't a religious society for good works. Nor is a church an incidental means of grace. It's not just to get people saved, though it should do that. Nor is it a bit like a filling station where we come to get a weekly top-up. But the church should be central to building our personal and corporate corporate relationship with God. The church, remember, it's about building that relationship. We are called out. We're called for. We're also called together. The people in Egypt were disparate without common focus So in calling them out, calling for a relationship, God God called them together. He wanted to make one people of them, not because they were better, not because they were more numerous, but because he loved them. So they ate the Passover together. They left Egypt together. It's important to underline that the call of God is not purely a private affair. God calls together a congregation, the people of God. You are his community here, part of his whole community in this town of Coleraine on the north coast in Northern Ireland, across this island in the UK, in Europe, in God's world. And this implies that the gathering with God's people for worship, for teaching, for fellowship, for discipleship, for mission and developing ministry is the core of what the church is all about. If you think about it, churches are a unique feature of contemporary society. It's not a brilliant slide, but what I've tried to show is there a coming together of different ages and sexes and races, people from different economic and social backgrounds. So we need to build relationships based on the risen Lord Jesus, what he has done for us and for how he calls us. We need to build community in this congregation and beyond this congregation To want to keep on building community is important. And if you're keeping up with me and thinking through the implications, you'll know that faces with a challenge here in 2022. During the pandemic, congregations got the word out, kept in touch with people through online services. I assume You, like many others, were successful in doing that. But what's happening now? I can't speak about neuro, but I can speak about Ballywillan. We have people online each Sunday across the water. We've one online in an island in the Mediterranean. That's where she lives. It's been a great boon for older people and for those who are sick people who can't be at worship. We've even some who aren't Presbyterians who've never been in our building. But last Sunday, as the announcements were being made at the start, there were 147 devices online. 
How many of those were unable to be in the building? 20%? 25%? Hardly more. It's not church. It's passive church. It's the consumer mentality. And it's not what God intends. Just think. Tomorrow or Tuesday, you get an invitation to go to Westminster Abbey tomorrow week to the biggest funeral in three generations. Would you say, no, I'll just stay home and watch it on the telly? What about when the King of Kings invites us and calls us? And I'm actually speaking to those of you who are at home, who are watching online. Should you not be here if you possibly can, contributing actively to what's going on? For the togetherness of a congregation is important in helping us to face lots of things, including the scourge of individualism, which means that people get isolated even when there are others around them. For in the church, we demonstrate that every individual counts. We're called together to be his people. Remember, we need each other. Fourthly, God calls us to his promised future. What was Israel's goal? The promised land, though they'd never seen it before. What's the goal of Christians? God's future and, prom and present inheritance, though we don't know fully what that is. I mentioned the Greek word ecclesia. That's a dynamic concept, not a static one. Being church is not being passive. It's not about just sitting and listening. If it's God's church, we're to reflect his nature and his calling. The temptation is to look back to the past, which we're tempted to perceive as the good old days. I can just hear as this autumn goes on, some of you sidling up to Richard Gregg, your convener, and saying, just get us a minister. And some of you may be saying, just get us a minister like Robert McMullen. And others saying, just get us a minister not like Robert McMullen. But I ask you a question, all of you. How does looking to the past reflect God's nature? God wants us, you, and every congregation to look forward, to move forward. And God wants you to be thinking about your ministry as a congregation here in the center of Coleraine in the 2030s. Not as it was 20 years ago, but as it will be 10, 15 years in the future. God is unchanging yet he's always up to date. So how do we reflect him? Jesus tells his followers, go into all the world and make disciples. You shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Where we are in the wider society and to the ends of the earth, and that's a task for all of us, individually and corporately. In all of this, it's vital to remember that God has promised to be with us, to lead and to guide to the very end of the age. The church of Jesus Christ is God's called people. That's why we are the Ecclesia, 
the called of God. Earlier we prayed and gave thanks that the Queen accepted her calling at a young age. She sought to live it out right up to the very end. Do we accept God's calling on us? And are we seeking to live it out, no matter our age, no matter our situation? Do we seek to live it out to his glory and to his praise? Let us pray. Lord, as we think about your calling on us, we are humbled because we recognize our inadequacy. We recognize our sinfulness, our waywardness. And yet, Lord, by your Spirit working in us, we want to be better than we have been. And so we pray that at this time of transition in this congregation, we pray that you will enable us to look to the future, to allow you to work in us by your Spirit, whether we be in leadership or in supportive roles. Enable us, Lord, to have a vision that you give us to see where you are leading us, to trust in you, to have you working in us for your good, for our good and for your glory. Speak through your word in the power of your spirit. We pray in the Savior's name. Amen. Our closing hymn, Lord of the Church, we pray for our renewing.
after the blessing, you're asked to remain standing. We will uh, sing uh, the national anthem. There'll be two verses, they'll be on the screen. And can I just remind you, we're now singing, strange as it might seem, God save the King. And now may the blessing of God the Father who has chosen us, God the Son who sets us free, God the Spirit who lives in us, be upon us each one today and every day. Amen.